Welcome, everyone. This is uh, zero downtime migrations, uh, or in other words, migrating applications between Cassandra clusters of whatever variety with no downtime. Um, we'll get into the nitty gritty details of what that actually means in just a little bit. My name is Jeremy Hanna. Um, I've been around in the Cassandra community for a while. I would have made it to the first Cassandra Summit in 2010, but my daughter was born. So back, worked uh, with Cassandra just back that far, working at Datastax for about 11 years now, um, but in the Cassandra community for about 13 years, I guess. Um, hi everyone, my name is Wei Dan. Um, I've been with uh, Cassandra Community and Datastax both for uh, just a little over 10 years now. So um, we're going to be discussing uh, some technology that, um, some tools, so there's what's called a ZDM proxy or zero downtime migration proxy and a set of data migration tools that, that a, a number of engineers have worked on. We'd wanted, to, we wanted to just not take all the credit for all of this. We're just the people that are actually here physically present. But um, the, the list on the right that you see um, are a lot of engineers that have put a lot of work into um, the data migration tooling and been in the trenches doing a lot of these migrations um, over the last couple of years. Um, and the, the list on the left are those who are primarily focused on uh, what's called our, Z, our ZDM proxy. Um, the, the, the tool itself to help um, with the, the no downtime part, keeping two clusters in sync. Um, and Alice Lotini and Joao Rice um, in particular have done a, a good share of that work um, starting about three years ago. Yeah. So. Um, I see Stefano is also like, you know, in the audience. And same with Brett, Brett somewhere out here too, yeah, yeah. in the back. So yeah, we have some, if you have any additional questions about certain things. Um, so we'd like to just start off with um, what does it mean to be a zero downtime great migration? Um, what, how you might define that? Uh, Want to do it from the perspective of a user or the application developers because um, this is the process of migrating, uh, migrating applications from an origin to a target cluster, origin cluster to a target cluster without user awareness or service disruption. So. If you're on a banking app, you're on a social site, you're on whatever, you're on like a movie, movie streaming service or a game or something like that, you shouldn't see any blip or have to have some sort of like, by the way, at 3.30 this afternoon, something's happening or whatever. They should have nothing like that. And that's not to say that you might not have rolling restarts of your application servers or something like that, just as you would with something that is um, like stateless or something that, that can can refresh user connections and things like that. So something might be happening under the covers and we'll go over what those things are, but from a user's perspective that's using your app or your website or, or whatever IoT thing, um, they should have no awareness of what's going on under the covers except to say that their service is predictable and performant. Yeah, so one thing I'd like to call out here is that um, when we say origin and uh, target, uh, which you will see a lot in the diagrams and in the follow-up uh, in some of those uh, subsequent slides. So origin, hopefully that's um, you know, uh, self-explanatory, that, that's basically you're migrating from the origin cluster and then your uh, target is the, uh, uh, the data you will be going to. Um, so yeah, uh, just want to make sure that the, you're, you're um, clear on the terminology. So the scenarios and use cases, we originally designed this for migration to Datastax has a managed database called Astra, and it's a managed Cassandra, and people have had Cassandra clusters that they wanted to migrate to that. And so we wanted to create tooling to make that simpler for people, but as kind of like a added, added side benefit from that is that this can really be done for, and we've used it for a number of other reasons. So for instance, and, and this builds upon what you already have in your toolbox, right? So if you have a Cassandra cluster, you're trying to say, I want to be able to um, burst from my on-prem into the cloud because I want to go into the other region or I have this specific event. You can add a data center in a cloud and have it be the same cluster and you just kind of burst out to that other area with other application servers. Um, this adds something to that capability uh, because 
un under certain circumstances, you don't want to do that. So like if I'm on-prem and I'm going into a cloud provider, there's um, kind of some detangling, coupling things that you might have. So like authentication or other things having to do with like user management or um, uh, infrastructure and networking and things like that, that, that if you, you, you don't necessarily want to couple the two into a single cluster and having two separate clusters that are decoupled completely gives you a lot more freedom. And um, we'll go into to, to how, that, how that works. Um, or upgrading from an older version of Cassandra to a newer, newer version of Cassandra. If you're on 2.1 today using CQL, you might want to go to 5.0 tomorrow when it gets released in GA and you've kind of proven it out. And so not having to go through, if you've been in that situation, going through a lot of versions of Cassandra, upgrading in place is painful if you have to go like three steps and then do the upgrade as the stables along the way and things like that. Um, this helps with that as well because you have two different clusters. You have a lower risk because you don't have to say, okay, well, um, if something goes sideways, what is my state and how do I unwind from that? It's more like, okay, we have the target and it's completely independent. It's starting from scratch and you have this origin cluster and if I ever need to roll back, I'm good. Um, and then you don't even have to do the full cluster. So like you say, I wanna separate out this one app that's kind of like a nuisance app or a noisy app. It's really mission critical and we wanna keep it on its own hardware. Let's split that one app out and the, the ZDM proxy will allow you to do that and or consolidating either direction. Um, when it comes to compatibility, um, we've tested it against everything you see here um, in one form or another. Uh, I think most of these in production, going from one to the other. Um, it speaks the native protocol versions 2, 3, and 4. And so anything beyond Cassandra um, 2.1.7, I think, and, um, or similar data stacks enterprise version, associated data stacks enterprise version, um, and it goes to version four. Version five, protocol version five, SQL protocol version five is in beta in Cassandra five, or un until Cassandra five. Um, the ZDM proxy is able to downgrade, kind of like negotiate the, the protocol down to version four if it needs to. So it's not like it's a critical thing that it doesn't have version five in there yet. It's just um, one of those things that we haven't gotten to yet. Cassandra five is not out yet, but that's one thing that we want to add. Um, so pretty much anything that speaks CQL of any sort should be able to do this. Um, and has this been done before? Yes, we've been doing it for about uh, a little over two years. It started development over about three years ago. Um, been doing this for a, a little over two years with a number of, of customers. I put it, we put it in, into categories of kind of verticals because they oftentimes will have different tolerances for security, for SLAs, for throughputs and all of that. And so just to give you an idea of, okay, well, has this been done for a lot of clusters? And you have like, you know, lots and lots of clusters for individual cl uh, companies, or you have like, my favorite is like a gaming company that released a game, like an online massive game with crazy bursty traffic. And they were using the proxy to, to bifurcate traffic during the production launch. And I'm like, that's a really nice validation that this is not going to fall over. Um, yep. So, and also the data volume is like uh, like twenty plus terabyte, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So, so in the background, you're migrating all the, the all the historical data. Yep. Um, so, and, and and we'll go through some of the the. So, so we wanted to to, to kind of give you some context as to why, um, and then the tools that that are involved. So. The, the proxy that I've been talking about, it's a lightweight CQL um, protocol handler wrapper to be able to, um, to do this bifurcation of traffic and keep things in sync. Um, it's one job is to say, I have these two clusters and I need to keep those two clusters in sync after time X. So it handles all the real time incoming traffic and at each request it says, I'm going to synchronously make it so that this cluster and this cluster receive the exact same updates at the exact same consistency level. And it's synchronous. And so, um, and it's common, it's written in Golang, it's deployed as a Docker container, and it's all open source. And so if you have any, um, you know, issues or whatever, it's an open source project out there. Um, and, and yeah, so wh why would we want to have something dedicated for this? 
and it's stateless. That's the other important thing. It's stateless, so that you're not having to, to worry about it. It does, it does have to, to read, to, to understand whether it's a read or a write to do the appropriate thing. So it does have to kind of, so in terms of end-to-end -end security, you can have client to proxy encryption, proxy to clusters encryption, but it does need to be able to see what the requests are actually trying to do in terms of reads or writes. Um, and so why would you want to do this? Um, we've seen at other times when people go from one completely, one data store to a completely different data store where they might say, okay, well, let's do this, something with Kafka, something with like, um, you know, queuing and things like that, or you want to bifurcate within your application. And it puts a lot, I mean, it, it seems like a simple idea in theory, but it puts a lot of burden on the application developers. And if you have hundreds of microservices, you're telling all of those teams with their own kind of requirements, regulatory compliance and all that kind of stuff that they have to do some throwaway code that um, has to be tested and all of that just for this one period of transition. And so this is why we said, let's take this out of the hands of the developers and have this instead of all these hundreds of people that are working on these applications, put this into the hands of the operators. And so the application developers don't even care. They just say, okay, what do I point my, my, my application to? Um, and so that's, that's kind of the, the rationale here with the, with the assumption that you're moving from one CQL data store to another CQL data store. Um, the other tool in the toolbox here is the, the thing that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, it's nice to have something that's kind of a dedicated tool and resource to say, I'm going to migrate and also validate historical data. Um, from tables between origin and target clusters. This is an open source tool again. It does things like that you, you would hope it does, like auto detects the schema and so, instead of saying, okay, list all the tables here, list all the tables here, it'll, it'll, it'll do checking on like UDTs, all the exotic kind of like data types and, and uh, UDTs, collections, counters. Uh, make sure that the right timestamps and TTLs are preserved from the origin so you're not stepping on data when you go to the target cluster. Um, it checks for differences, and it even optionally reconciles the data. So if you have some sort of item, non-idempotent operation, like an L lightweight transaction that depends on the current state of the origin cluster that's not in the state, of the, currently in the state of the, the target cluster, um, you can do this after the fact and say, okay, well, there, was there anything that is off between these two clusters? And then reconcile that for me to make sure that both clusters are in the same state. Um, and because you're operating within time windows, you can say, okay, up until like beginning of time to time X for when we started using this proxy, only copy that data initially. And then once you've done that, you, you, you have that data done. And then as you move forward, you can say, okay, well, you can do incremental reconciliations along the way to say, let's just make sure, you know, that, that absolutely sure that these two clusters are in sync. I mean, um, what we've seen is like, Facility and ease of use and all of that, those are all great, but consistency of data is what people are very much after. And people don't want to lose their jobs as they migrate <laughs> from one data store to another. Um, and then, obviously, you want to be able to tune the reads, for instance, like if you're migrating from one data store to another, the reads on the origin cluster, don't, you don't want to interfere with the regular real-time traffic from the, the origin cluster. So this is all kind of like the tool context. Um, and so, yeah, go ahead, Wayne. So uh, uh, Jeremy just uh, walks through some of those uh, components. So uh, now we're going to take a closer look at those components that we touch upon, and then uh, we will walk through the migration process in a little bit more detail. Next slide. So uh, before the migration, uh, you basically your application will just do the regular read and write via the uh, CQL driver against your origin cluster, which is you know to the right those uh, orange ring as you see here. And next, please. Okay, so this is basically during the migration. Um, so all the activities are having here, and what basically as you can see from this picture, we have two additional key components into the picture. So that's to avoid introducing any downtime. So one component, as you see in the middle, this uh, ZDM proxy. So uh, those ZDM proxy basically handle the real-time requests generated by the application instance. So the proxy is there to implement the dual write logic um, so that the, the same write can be sent concurrently to both origin and target cluster. 
And then as you see on the right, uh, so uh, the other component that's called the existing data migrator. So it's basically transfer all the existing data from the origin to the target. And these two components, they are basically independent of each other, uh, but they are used in conjunction to achieve that zero downtime migration. And um, uh, next, please. So as you see here, we, we basically set up at least three ZDM proxy instances. So they are high throughput and they are stateless. So, uh, which means that they are horizontally scalable. Um, so we configure them to point to both the origin cluster and target cluster where ZDN UTO or Kubernetes. And then we update the application client, um, as you see on the left. So those clients now point to the proxy. Um, so um, uh, you can actually you know, do a, like a rolling restart of your application servers. Um, so this way, your application can still provide services to the end user without any interruption. And um, as uh, uh, Jeremy has mentioned previously, the proxy's one job is to keep both clusters in sync uh, per request. And if a write request come in at a consistency level of a local quorum, it will execute uh, that write at local quorum in parallel on both the origin and target cluster. Um, and also, uh, one other key thing to remember here is that uh, the proxy will only return success to the client if both the origin and target cluster have returned acknowledgement that this, uh, the ride is successful. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, we have an existing data migrator. So you know, the component to the very right. So that's basically migrated historical data from the origin to the target cluster. Uh, but uh, the existing mi data migrator can also be served as a validation or reconciliation. And here, through this whole process, as you see in the middle, there's a, there's a red arrow that's pointing to the left. That's the read. Um, so um, in here, we are basically just continuing to read from the origin cluster until that whole existing data migrator has finished reading all the data, all the historical data from uh, your origin cluster and move that into the target cluster. Uh, so basically, the target cluster has all of the origin cluster's data. And, uh, then we can move on to the next stage. Okay, so here you can see that uh, we no longer have the existing data migrator because um, you know, there's no use for that anymore. And um, also the um, uh, read arrow um, to the left is now moved from reading from the origin cluster to the target cluster. So this is where that uh, you are doing the final verification. So um, uh, you, you basically... Uh, you will continue to write to both clusters in case anything go wrong that will give you still a chance to roll back. So you can just, you know, if you want to roll back and just point your application back to the origin cluster. Um, nothing is lost at all. Um, so, uh, but I, I do want to point out that this is the last step before you really cutting completely over to the target cluster. So this is the time that you want to do some final validation of the target cluster's capabilities. Uh, by capability, uh, what I mean is that uh, your target cluster, um, there may be a different CKR store. They need to have exactly you know, what you expect from your application, like you know, in terms of the CKR support and all that stuff. And um, as well as the capacity, it does have the bandwidth. It's able to you know, process the amount of uh, requests, um, you know, read and write requests um, you were expecting from your application. So this is the last stage that you, you can do that uh, final verification. And next, please. So now, um, after migration, it's actually quite easy. Um, basically, now you're fully satisfied that the state of the new cluster, um, so it's able to handle the, uh, the traffic requirement, will just repoint your application to the target cluster, and the migration is fully done. OK, so next. Um, so yeah, now we, we kind of like, you know, um, Breaking this down into uh, a few high-level phases, uh, just to explain this a little bit more. Um, so um, for phase zero, well, basically, this is the stage that you prepare your target cluster. So this is like, um, you know, you would need to create the target cluster. You need to configure the access to it. You need to create the schema so that the, the target cluster schema is matching the origin cluster schema. And then also, very importantly, you want to make sure you, you, you test it. You're sure that, it, it, that your target cluster is working well for the application being migrated. And then, um, yeah, you basically just do some 
uh, validation that the um, this migration is is going to uh, work well. This uh, application, you know, once it's pointing to the target, is going to work well. So you are basically even you don't have any data migrated over yet. You are just want to make sure that's happening. Okay, uh, Jeremy, you want to go to phase sure. one? So yeah, so that's all the preparatory phase, and then you deploy the ZDM proxy through the Ansible um, automation or through Kubernetes. Um, and then you point your application servers to the proxy, and then it handles the authentication and the, and the, uh, um, the traffic routing to the two clusters in each of the areas. Okay. Um, so at this point, we move on to phase two. So this is actually, um, you know, probably the lo longest running uh, phase in the whole migration because um, you are basically talking about doing that uh, existing data migration from the origin to the target. And if you have a, like a very large data footprint, uh, this could take, you know, uh, days to finish. Um, so um, uh, this is basically, you know, the whole thing is uh, existing data migrator's job. Um, so, um, yeah, that's basically, you know, um, you just let whatever kind of, uh, you know, um, historical data migration to happen during this time. Yeah, and people often ask, like, as we're doing these migrations, like, how long does this supposed to take? Um, and it's long as, as long as you want it to take, really. I mean, the data migration is one important element, but as long as you feel comfortable, like, being on the two, the two, uh, the two clusters with the proxy, is, is, is as long as you're wanting to make sure that you don't have any kind of hiccups along the way, it's really, this is really meant to be a, a risk averse sort of, sort of thing to make sure that um, you're comfortable with the new cluster and comfortable migrating. And so that leads to, to number three is, is now that you have like um, a, a good base of, the, of, the, of the, the data sets in both clusters that, are, that, you, that you think are pretty well good, um, we've added a feature that's in the middle that says, okay, before I cut read traffic over to the new cluster, I want to make sure, because we've been bifurcating writes this entire time, and um, your application, when you actually do a cutover, you're going to kind of unleash all of this read traffic over to the new cluster, right? And so um, we added a step in the middle that says, you can optionally do this, but you can point, um, still the reads go to the origin cluster, but you mirror the reads to the tar target cluster, and the results are just thrown onto the floor. And the purpose of that is to say, can the target cluster handle uh, gracefully the writes and the reads with sufficient throughput and at those SLAs, like with at, at the latencies that you're expecting? So again, this is another step to avoid the risks of surprises as you migrate to the new cluster. So uh, just to add to phase three, so this um, uh, optional step is an async dual read. So basically, that means uh, it's not going to increase your latency. Like your read is still going from that primary cluster. So um, yeah, so th basically this is really just to make sure that uh, you introduce extra load on your target and your target is able to handle that. Um, and now we move on to phase four. So uh, once the existing data has been fully transferred and any validation check has been successfully executed, target cluster can become your new source of choose uh, for your read. So at this point, you basically flip a switch in the proxy. So then the proxy will basically route, route all the read to the target cluster. Um, and at the same time, the, the proxy will still send the writes to both databases so that they are, uh, the both databases are kept in sync. And um, uh, throughout uh, this whole process up to here, uh, as you see at, at the bottom, uh, we, we just pointed out that the rollback is still very easy. So if anything goes wrong at any point, you can still just connect your application directly to your origin cluster. And at this point, you don't really have any data loss because it's always do right. Um, so you don't, yeah, if you need, to, you, you don't need to do any restore or anything. So it's really like, you know, it's very low, low risk kind of, uh, you know, um, just roll back. And that gets us to the, the point of no return, right? So you point your applications directly to the target cluster. Everybody goes home, everybody's happy, you're saving money, or you've gone to the new place, and, and, and things are good. And you still could roll back if you really wanted to. You just do the whole process in reverse. But hopefully these, this, this gated process gives you confidence that this new thing is going to be sufficient for you. And we've had people run on the proxy for a few weeks. We've had people run on the proxy for six months. We've had run on, run on the proxy during a go-live event. And so it's, it's not a problem of running on the proxy. It's just a problem of 
or it's not a problem, it's just more of a when you feel comfortable. And, and the, the whole thing is just to, to reduce the risk of going from one thing to the other. Um, and so that's, that hopefully gives you a better idea of the high level here. Um, so as we're going forward, I mean, we've tested it in a number of circumstances. Um, we want to do some more testing with Cassandra 5. We want to add version 5 support. Um, we have custom authenticator support for, I think, InstaCluster and, and Ivan. And, yeah. um, and that's, that's in a branch right now. We need to do a release with that. Improve the Kubernetes um, support to have like some more dashboards and things. Um, one thing it does right now is you can configure it to say the now function in CQL, it, re it, it, it produces a time UUID, right? And so if you're sending that to two clusters and you have two different time UUIDs, that's kind of a problem. And so what it does is it says you can optionally have it parse and rewrite that to say instead of having now, it replaces that, liter that, that now in there with the time UUID. So it's identical to both clusters. Um, we'd like to maybe expand that in the future, improve the parsing and things because there's a little bit of overhead in there. That's why it's optional um, to, to use like date time CQL functions and UUID functions to, to replicate that same pattern. Um, but that's, that's stuff that we're, is in our future work. So uh, before we get to questions, we only have a few minutes. Um, these are some of the links. They're all open source projects. The extensive documentation. It was open source a year ago, and we've had a lot of documentation. And um, Stefano here, up here um, did a Gitpod um, interactive scenario. So if you're wondering how this whole process works to try it out, you can go to Gitpod. It does it creates a cluster for you. You do have to um, create an Astra account because Astra is what you're migrating to for the purposes of this kind of enclosed. Um, demo, not demo, but uh, walkthrough. So it does all the steps and you, you perform the steps and you can see in the terminals what's going on and the application traffic and all that kind of stuff and do the rewrite, rerouting of the stuff. Um, this QR code is to more easily create an Astra account. It's free. It's like no credit card or anything like that. And so mm -hmm. this allows you to just kind of go through all those steps, which is kind of the outside of the scope of this conversation. Um, but are there... Are there any questions? We have some common questions that we have, but any questions? Yeah, in the middle there? You, yeah. Uh-huh. Thank you. Yeah, the question so, is whether or not yeah. you use CDC or interim backups to migrate the data. Um, that's what this handles right here. It's a Spark-based tool that uses CQL to export from the origin. And I mean, there's a number of tools out there, but, but this one is specifically is tailored for CQL workloads to extract and then push to the other data store with the reconciliation and everything. So you can, you can start your, your historical data migration at any time, even before you even think about putting the, the proxy in place, because that's going to take some time. And so you, so you don't have to go strictly according to these phases in terms of migrating the data. You can do that previously. Um, and, then, and then only do kind of like the migrate and validate of the data with that Cassandra data migrator of the window of time that you haven't already done. So that, that reduces the time that you have to have the proxy in place. So you could even have the proxy down to a day or two if you wanted to, and and done the bulk of the work of migration before that. Is that? Right. Yeah. Right. And oftentimes people just say, "Okay, let's start at a time X, and then we'll start the data migration." Um, oftentimes we've seen it where they do the data migration while the proxy's in place. Yeah. Up front with the hat. So that's what, that's the, the the data migrator will since Cassandra is kind of like the the last right wins. You, if you take historical data 
um, if this is answering your question, is to say the timestamp of that write is going to be in the past. And if you get new data that comes in, um, getting the wrap-up signal here, um, if you new, get new data that comes in, it'll have a newer timestamp. And so those will reconcile, and then the, the new data will take precedence over the older data. It's very similar. I think this is kind of splitting out applications, and, and I mean, this is more splitting out applications and other things. It, it, it solves similar problems, but it has a different, kind of more of a different use case. That's, that's kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say, I'm looking up Piotr, and yeah. Yeah, those two And those guys back yeah. there. Yeah. So, so um, but yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, maybe one more question. And, Yeah. How much weight does the proxy that, is a, that is one of the most common questions that we get, is that it's not free, right? You have something that goes in the middle. Anything you put in the middle is not free. So what we've, we've found through some, some, some testing and practical experience is it, like a couple of milliseconds yeah, so it's a single for each digit, request. Yeah, single digit millisecond. Um, yeah. you know, basically, the idea is that the, you know, the proxy- each statement, actually. Yeah, as, as designed as a, like a, like a goal, very lightweight goal routine. So uh, yeah, it's basically, it doesn't really um, you know, add too much additional latency, but it's like you know, single digit, like you know, less than 10 or you know, around 10 millisecond uh, you know, with the proxy in the middle. Yeah, and, and that's per statement. So if you have large batches of many, many statements, the overhead necessarily is the, the proxy kind of has to go through each statement within the batch and determine if that statement, because you can mix reads and writes, right? So you can have all these statements that you have to kind of say, okay, is this a read or a write? And then I have to send it and that sort of thing. So it, it's not like it has to do it in, in serially, but it does have to do the rewrites or the, or the, the traffic routing of each statement and read each statement. So that's, that's, that's the, the one caveat, is if you have large batches, then you might, might want to be careful because the overhead starts to add up. OK. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think we're done. If you want to talk to us, we're, we're happy to answer additional questions. But yeah. I think we have to wrap up there. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you.